Yes, guys. So let's continue with the other part of India 16, 40, and 38, where we deal with depreciation and amortization. Guys, depreciation and amortization are integral part of the standards itself. Earlier, if you remember, AS6 was there, which was dealing specifically with depreciation. But now there's no AS6 related standard. It has been merged into your India AS16 itself. So 16 and 40 will deal with depreciation. 38 deals with amortization. Guys, when I talk about this concept of depreciation and amortization, I will have to include another topic as well into it. That is Schedule 2 of Companies Act 2013. Schedule 2 deals with depreciation. So I'll have to embed all the three together. Then only we will be able to identify what exactly is the depreciation. Because you need to understand that the, uh, it is the company which is getting India's adoption. So companies are also governed by your dear Companies Act 2013. So Schedule 2 depreciation becomes very important and an integral part of the discussion regarding depreciation and amortization. So we'll have to combine and check guys. Both of them are very equally significant. So let's see. If you remember under recognition and measurement, I just said under India 16 and 38, there's a cost approach. Even under 40, I said there's no revaluation approach possible, but only cost approach is possible. However, where property, plant and equipment and your intangible assets are involved, you can either have a cost approach or a revaluation approach at the option of the enterprise. So your depreciation and amortization is parked into your cost approach. What is your cost approach saying? Your cost approach that is on balance sheet date, every asset has to be measured at cost minus accumulated depreciation or accumulated amortization. That is your cost approach. Now under this cost approach, how do we measure depreciation and amortization is the concept. But let's keep it aside and let's get into the concept of what is cost and what is revaluation. Cost approach says that cost less accumulated depreciation less accumulated impairment is the written down value of the asset to be presented on each balance sheet date. While under revaluation approach, it is the revalued amount of the asset reduced by the subsequent depreciation and subsequent impairment. It is not necessary for us to impair the asset every year. The frequency of revaluation will also be discussed where you will understand that revaluation need not be done every year. You can do it once in three to five years as well. Therefore, if I'm doing only one revaluation every three years, the remaining two years after the revaluation, I'll have to calculate depreciation or impairment. Therefore, it should be given as revalued amount or the earliest revalued amount or the latest revalued amount reduced by the subsequent depreciation and subsequent impairment. That is your measurement on balance sheet date. If I'm applying revaluation approach for property plan and equipment, as well as your intangible asset. What is your revaluation approach? Like I told you frequency of revaluation, look at it. If the fair value of the property plan and equipment changes frequently, that means you are experienced that this particular equipment or this particular property plan and equipment has a change in fair value very frequently. Best example, mobile phone, iPhone 10, iPhone 11, iPhone 12, Samsung. I don't know where it, the S series is, S S11, S10, S9. You have gone up to S13 also. Now you look at OnePlus, OnePlus One to start. And today we are already at OnePlus 8 or OnePlus X or something like that. So if you look at the developments happen to the asset on a very frequent basis. So technologically, there is a redundance of technology which requires you to charge a depreciation on these goods or which requires you to have a fair valuation of these assets on a frequent basis. Whenever the fair value of such assets keep on changing every year, then you will have to at least revalue them once in every year, each balance sheet date. At least once in each year, you will have to measure the fair value. But there could always be certain assets like your vehicle. A vehicle's fair value may not change every year on year because there is no significant change in the technology. The diesel vehicle stays a diesel vehicle, a petrol vehicle stays a petrol vehicle. There's no significant change in the technology which happens every year. Therefore, 
in case of other property plan and equipment where the fair value is not expected to change frequently i will measure the fair value at least once in 3 to 5 years at least once in the gap of 3 to 5 years that is at the distinction at the discretion of the management management decides when they have to do the fair value depending on what is the asset and what is the nature of that particular asset clear even your laptops change very frequently i uh, i7 i5 i5 8th generation i5 9th generation i7 11th generation is also gone so you need to understand that technological changes is requiring you to have a change in fair values frequently your property value regarding your land and building significant change in fair value occurs every year in such cases i will do the fair valuation each year whenever i do fair value two things can happen either there is an increase in the value of land or uh, uh, increase in the value of an asset or decrease in the value of an asset what is the treatment whenever there is an increase or a decrease in the value of an asset under the revaluation approach under revaluation ap approach at the first time when i revalue the asset and now the revaluation of the asset is upwards in such case the increase in the value of an asset should be credited to revaluation surplus it should be credited to revaluation surplus therefore the entry which i pass is asset account debit to revaluation surplus account but let's say first revaluation itself is downward that means you are reducing the value of the asset or i would say that the fair value of the asset under revaluation approach is less than the carrying value of the asset in such case where the revalued amount is less than the carrying value i have to charge it to pnl so in straight sense i will write the entry as pnl account debit to asset clear this is the end treatment when you are initially first time revaluing the asset but asset has a useful life of a long period of time so revaluation happens subsequently as well so whenever there is a subsequent revaluation for a particular asset which was initially upward revalued initially the asset was revalued upwards subsequently again the asset is again upward revalued what do you do furthermore increase again credited to revaluation surplus entry will stay the same asset account debit to revaluation surplus but an asset which was earlier upward revalued where i credited it to revaluation surplus now is going for a downward revaluation that means the fair value or under revaluation approach is less than the carrying value in such case to the extent of downward revaluation i will cancel it out from the revaluation surplus available because the asset was earlier upward revalued and i parked the increase in the value of the asset to revaluation surplus now when i subsequently revalue the asset downwards to the extent of downward revaluation i will cancel it out from revaluation surplus you will say sir let's say upward revaluation earlier was 5 now downward revaluation is 20 then what you will do to the extent of 5 i will debit revaluation surplus to the balance excess 15 downward revalued i will debit the pnl so what is the entry revaluation surplus account debit pnl account debit to asset this entry will come in if the asset is now downward revalued but was upward revalued initially second part of subsequent revaluation subsequent revaluation for an asset which was earlier downward revalued earlier the asset was downward revalued now i am increasing the value of the asset or the fair valuation is more than the carrying value earlier when i downward revalued the asset what did you do i charged it to pnl now you are increasing the value of an asset then what you will do credit the pnl to the extent it was debited earlier balance i will transfer it to revaluation surplus let's say for example asset of 100 rupees was initially downward revalued to 95 entry pnl to asset 5 subsequently the asset increased from 95 to 102 then what you'll do to the extent of 5 which was earlier debited to pnl now i credit the pnl so asset account debit 7 to pnl 5 to revaluation surplus 2 so to the extent it was debited earlier 
Now you credit the PNL balance if any or excess if any. I will credit it to revaluation surplus. Clear? If an asset was initially downward revalued, subsequently also downward revalued, then I will straightforward transfer the downward revaluation to PNL. 100 rupee asset earlier downward revalued to 95. Entry PNL to asset 5. Now it became 92. Entry PNL, PNL account debit to asset 3. So subsequently again I will debit PNL to the extent of further downward revaluation. So this is particularly my table which I give for treatment of revaluation surplus. When it is upward revalued and subsequently downward revalued or where it is downward revalued subsequently upward revalued. So this is the table. I have a good look at the table because this table gives you ample clarity on what is the treatment each time you revalue the asset either upwards or you revalue the asset downwards. Now question comes up. Every reserve has a purpose. Yes or no? Every reserve has a purpose. p &L or general reserve can be distributed as dividends or can be used to write off losses or can be distributed as bonus. Your uh, capital redemption reserve can be utilized for issue of fully paid bonus share. Your capital reserve can be utilized for writing down of, sorry, writing off of capital losses. So every reserve has a purpose. Even securities premium had a purpose. Securities premium can write off preliminary expenses, can write off underwriting commission, can write off pre premium on redemption of preference shares or debentures, can issue fully paid bonus shares. So many purposes you had. So that means every reserve has a purpose. That means revaluation surplus should also have a purpose. What is the purpose for which revaluation surplus can be used? There are three guidance notes which he gave. First one, utilization of revaluation surplus for declaring dividend. Dividend is declared out of distributable profits computed as per Companies Act. And according to the definition of distributable profits, your, your uh, uh, revaluation surplus cannot be included. Therefore, you cannot declare dividend out of revaluation surplus. First one. Number two. Utilization of revaluation surplus for issue of bonus shares. Bonus according to Companies Act can be only issued out of cash reserves. Reserves created out of profits. Reserves earned in cash. But revaluation surplus is not earned in cash. Pure non-cash reserve. Since it is a non-cash reserve, it cannot be utilized for issue of uh, bonus shares. Two guidance notes I discussed. In both guidance notes I am saying, not possible to declare dividend, not possible to issue bonus, then what can it be used for? He says, revaluation surplus has only one use. Either you reduce it from, uh, either you utilize it when you further downward revalue the asset or such amount of revaluation surplus can be credited to PNL to the extent of excess depreciation charged in PNL due to upward revaluation of this. For example, let's say an asset had an original cost of 100. It was upward revalued to 105. Let's say the useful life of the asset is 5. On original cost, the depreciation to be charged would have been 20. But since you have upward revalued the asset, 105 rupees, 5 rupees transferred to revaluation surplus. Now the depreciation is not 20, but it should be 21. So he's saying 1 rupee of excess depreciation which you debited to PNL to the extent of 1 rupee, you credit the PNL from revaluation surplus. That means you will recognize the entry of revaluation surplus to PNL 1 rupee. So debit side depreciation 21, credit side revaluation surplus 1 rupee. Ultimately, the net effect on PNL should be only to the extent of depreciation on original cost. That is the only possible utilization of revaluation surplus which is allowed as per the guidance note issued by ICI. Clear? Revaluation surplus is a non-cash reserve which is ineligible 
to pay in the form of dividend or bonus shares to shareholder. It can be credited to OCI in the statement of profitability to the extent of excess depreciation charge on upward revaluation of asset. Here. Now, park the depreciation aside, sorry, revaluation aside. Let's get back to your depreciation and amortization where we'll also look into schedule 2 as well. Depreciation, how do you charge depreciation or define depreciation? The cost of an asset that is a property, plant and equipment or investment property or intangible asset. The cost of an asset should be charged to p and l should be charged to p and l as depreciation how long over the useful life of the asset how much in the proportion of economic benefits expected to be derived from the use of the asset i'll repeat the cost of the property plant and equipment or intangible asset or investment property should be charged to the debit of p and l as depreciation how long over the expected useful life of the asset how much in the proportion of the economic benefits expected to be derived from the use of this now what is this economic benefits expected to be derived from the use of this let's say for example you purchase the new machinery guys what will happen Initially, I'll start with 20% production. I will distribute samples to my customers. I will start accepting orders from customers. Slowly, my production capacity increased to 35. Second year, it became 50. Third year, it became 80. Fourth year, it became 100. So what happened? Your utilization of the asset is expected to go up every year. So that is the pattern in which the benefit is expected to be utilized from the use of the asset. Take an example of a new vehicle. You bought a new bike, man. What do you do? Bike is a fancy. Tell me what do you do with your new bike? First time when I buy, I first go to every place. Make sure that I show off my back bike as much as possible. Right? Every day I keep cleaning my bike. Or what? Every day. At each uh, traffic signal i'll get down I'll, I'll clean my bike i'll see whether it is shining or not again i get back on the bike and i go one year later once in a day i'll clean my bike two years later once a week i'll clean my bike three years later every time there is a rain i will throw my bike outside automatically it will get washed free wash so after fourth year and fifth year i don't want to use that bike anymore I'm not fancy of my bike anymore. So what happened? Your utilization of or the economic benefit that you derived from the vehicle just at the beginning slowly started dropping, 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 dropping. That is fundamentally the pattern of economic benefit expected to be derived from the use of an asset. So in the case of a vehicle, I will charge higher depreciation at the beginning and lower depreciation towards the end. But in the case of the machinery example which I gave you, I will charge lower depreciation at the beginning since my capacity utilization is less than 50%. As the capacity utilization keeps on going up, I will keep on charging higher depreciation. That means the depreciation should represent the pattern in which ex economic benefits are expected to be derived from the use of the asset for which you use Companies Act Schedule 2. What about amortization? Amortization is exactly similar to depreciation where the cost of intangible asset is charged to the debit of P&L as amortization over the period for which over, over the expected useful life in the proportion of economic benefit expected to be derived by the enterprise from the use of the intangible asset. However, in case of amortization, he says one small paragraph extra line what is that extra line he says your pattern of economic benefits derived from the use of the asset may not be the same as revenue generated from the use of intangible asset i'm saying revenue generated from the intangible asset 
may not be the same pattern in which economic benefits are derived from the use of the asset. Why is that so? Revenues are dependent upon lot of other factors. It is dependent upon market demand. It is dependent upon customers, uh, you know, capacity to pay. May not only be dependent upon the utilization of that particular asset. That's why he says revenue based amortization may not be deemed appropriate in most circumstances. He is not ruling out. He is saying most circumstances it is inappropriate. But I shouldn't use is a wrong statement. I am saying it is inappropriate in most circumstances. That's it. I stopped them. I am not saying in all circumstances. I am just saying in most circumstances, revenue based amortization is not appropriate. Why is that so? Because revenue is determinant not only on the basis of utilization of the intangible asset, but is based on multiple other factors. Clear? I have three determinants of depreciation. First one is cost of the asset. Second one is estimated residual value. Third one is estimated useful life. These are the three determinants of depreciation out of which two are estimates. Your residual value is an estimate. That is nothing but the amount which I expect to collect from the asset at the end of its useful life upon disposal. Expected estimated useful life the time period for which the enterprise expects to uh, expect to derive benefit from the use of the asset. So estimated useful life and estimated use residual value both are management estimates. Therefore, some most of the situations you will find that these two get revised very frequently. What is your schedule 2 talking about? Your schedule 2 of companies that discusses about depreciation. To talk about depreciation, your schedule 2 divides your assets into two categories. First category is called as continuous processing plant. Second category is called as other assets. Other assets. And these assets are generally called as extra shift depreciation assets. Your continuous processing plant, there is no shift. Continuously, it keeps on working 24 by 7, 365 days, it keeps on working. Such kind of assets are called as no extra shift depreciation assets. Why is there no extra shift depreciation? Because continuous processing plants, they are designed in a particular way that they are expected to run throughout. There is no shifts in a continuous processing plant. I'll give you an example. I don't know how many of you see. But most of us, we come across metal structures like your telecom towers, which are silver in color. They are particularly silver in color because of a factor called as galvanizing. What is galvanizing? Galvanizing is nothing but, galvanizing is nothing but a zinc coating on the metal structure. Why do they do it fancy? Eh? Because silver looks better? No, no. Galvanizing is primarily used to avoid corrosion because it is outside and it is exposed to extreme temperatures. There is a very, very good reason or very good chance for corrosion to happen on the metal. To avoid this corrosion, they do a particular technique called as zinc galvanizing. What is a galvanizing? Huge swimming pool type of a tub will be there. Huge, massive. Much, much bigger than swimming pools. Boiling zinc is actually added to it. Zinc is put at a boil. I'll have a crane which comes in. It will dip the material into the zinc and get it out. Automatically galvanizing process is complete. Now, this zinc to bring it to a boiling temperature takes 48 hours. To cool down, it takes at least 24 to 30 hours. If I shut down the plant, to restart the plant again, it takes another 48 hours to reheat the entire zinc, to bring them to a boiling temperature where galvanizing is possible. That means, as such that particular equipment is meant for continuous processing. 
I don't expect the zinc galvanizing plant to be shut at any point of time unless and until there is an extreme situation. I will always expect that the zinc galvanizing plant will keep on continuing to be used. That means these assets are designed and are meant to be used on a continuous processing basis. They are designed and are meant to be used on continuous processing basis. In such case, the useful life should be as prescribed by the Schedule 2. Schedule 2 prescribed separately and I will have to take the useful life from there. However, other assets which are not specifically designed and meant to be used for entire continuous processing, if I use them for 3 shifts, each shift is 8 hours. If I continuously use them for 3 shifts, 24 hours, I kept on using the asset. Will it become a continuous processing plant? No. Because it is not designed to be used for entire 24 hours. You can shut down the plant, you can reopen the plant again and start producing. They are not designed for continuous processing. These assets are called as other than C CPP assets or continuous processing plants or you can call, call them as extra shift depreciation assets. Such assets if they are working on a single shift basis, I will pick up the useful life as given under Schedule 2 of Companies Act. But if such a set, which is not a continuous processing plant, is used for two shifts, 16 hours in a day, in such case, Schedule 2 will not give you a separate useful life. Whatever separate useful life they have already given under single shift, that only is applicable. But since you are using on a double shift basis, the depreciation calculated as per single shift should be added by 50%. That means it should be 150% of the depreciation to be charged under single shift basis. Similarly, if I use such an asset where there is an extra shift depreciation and an asset is other than continuous processing plant for all three shifts in a day, that means throughout 24 hours in a day, then I will take the single shift depreciation and multiply it by 2 or add it by 100%. That means 2 times the depreciation I would have charged on the asset if it is used for one shift basis. Someone will say, sir, double shift should be multiplied by 2. Triple shift should be multiplied by 3. Absolutely not. Double shift should be multiplied by 1.5 and triple shift should be multiplied only by 2. Clear? Now, Schedule 2 has given me a particular useful life. Then he says, should I take a useful life? Can I take a useful life other than the, uh, other than the useful life given in Schedule 2? Is it permissible to take a useful life which is shorter than your Schedule 2 useful life? Or can I take a, a useful life longer than Schedule 2? There he says, Initially, initially when Companies Act was introduced, the statement read like this. An enterprise cannot, an enterprise cannot elect for a useful life which is greater than specified under Schedule 2. However, greater than means you can take a useful life which is equal to Schedule 2 or less than Schedule 2 for compliance to this particular Companies Act 2013. However, subsequently in 2014, these words got replaced. Instead of saying the enterprise, uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, saying that the enterprise should take a useful life which is less than or equal to Schedule 2, he put up like this. An enterprise should not elect, should not elect any useful life other than that specified under Schedule 2, not different from the useful life specified in Schedule 2, not different from, not different from means you cannot take less than that, you cannot take more than that. Okay, fine. And that means you have to take exactly whatever is a useful life under Schedule 2. And my question is, don't you think there should be a flexibility? How can you tell me what my useful life is? I can take a useful life which is other than Schedule 2. Who are you to stop me? No one will stop you. If an enterprise 
elects to apply a useful life other than the useful life specified under schedule 2 then the enterprise should provide sufficient disclosure that's it that's it so non compliance is never a crime as long as you are saying that yes i am not following schedule 2 i am taking a different useful life why because i feel that the useful life uh, uh, you know of the asset in my enterprise is much longer or much shorter than the schedule 2 useful life so that means a crime of non compliance can be covered by giving disclosure that means i will kill you and if i say that i kill you for this this is reason then i am not considered to be non compliant i am very much considered to be a compliant clear so that is what schedule 2 talks about yes guys when i said there are three determinants of depreciation and i said estimated useful life should be not different from the useful life specified under schedule 2 one more estimate is there that is estimated residual value according to schedule 2 the estimated residual value should not be exceeding 5% of the original cost should not exceed 5% of original cost of this again in 2014 just when when your, when your useful life was amended same amendment applied even to residual value because now he says the residual value of an asset should not be different from 5% of the original cost that means what exactly 5% should be the residual value non compliance again never crime sufficient disclosures are required if you take a residual value of less than or greater than 5% here any doubts till now in schedule 2 please let me know guys
like we have seen regarding amortization uh, depreciation even amortization also there is something to be discussed as far as useful life and residual value is concerned schedule 2 said the residual value should not be other than uh, different from 5% of the original cost and the useful life as described under schedule 2 of the of companies act should be com should be considered as its useful life anything other than that if you consider either in the case of residual value or useful life you will have to give sufficient disclosure correct keep it there now come to intangible assets regarding amortization i'm talking about the residual value of an amount of an intangible asset should always be considered as zero any intangible asset i'll always consider that its residual value is zero clear now however i can take a residual value other than zero only in two cases only in two situations i can take a residual value of an intangible asset as other than zero what are those two cases case number one where the enterprise has entered into a binding sale agreement with another enterprise to dispose the asset at the end of its useful life let's say for example movie a movie super hit movie eh? okay uh, let's say Amita Bachchan's greatest hit, Don or Shole, is an intellectual property right or an intangible asset as per India's 38. For example, uh, a particular company, let's say T Series, has acquired the right to make a digital of or a CD of Shole or Don for a period of five years. At the end of five years, series has granted at the end of five years i'm saying i will give you this right to another party x or let's say it has given to another company let's say <clears throat> some other company hmv let's say so what happens here at the beginning itself i have entered into a binding sale agreement saying that at the end of five years of my lease or at the end of the useful life of the asset i will dispose this asset or i will transfer this asset at a particular value in such case where residual value is available right at the beginning itself what is the residual value that agreed binding sale agreement price therefore in such cases residual value cannot be considered as zero when it cannot be considered as zero when the enterprise has entered into a binding sale agreement to acquire uh, to transfer the intangible asset at the end of its useful life at a particular value under the agreement then the residual value is not zero but it should be considered as the agreement price another case where residual value is not zero i cannot take the residual value of an intangible asset as zero if an active market exists there is an active market which exists for that intangible asset and i expect that this active market will continue to exist even at the end of the useful life of the asset. Then in such case, residual value is not zero, but residual value should be equal to the estimated fair market value at the end of useful life. Residual value is equal to estimated fair market value at the end of the useful life of the asset. Clear? So generally the residual value of an intangible asset should be considered as zero unless two situations. Number one, the entity entered into a binding sale agreement to dispose the intangible asset at the end of its useful life at an agreed price. In such case, residual value is equal to agreed price or agreement price or the intangible asset has an active market and such active market is expected to exist even towards the end of the useful life of the asset. In such case, residual value is not zero, but residual value is the estimated fair value of the asset or at the end of the useful life of the asset. Clear? Regarding useful life of the asset, there is a particular restriction under amortization of intangible asset, where he says, Generally, the useful life of an intangible asset should not exceed its legal right. That means, let's say I acquired the license of a particular software for 10 years 
then I will continue to take the useful life as less than or equal to 10 years. It cannot exceed by legal rights. Let's say I have purchased a tally software for three years. Then what is the useful life of tally software? It can be either equal to three years or less than three years. That's it. it cannot be greater than three years. However, it can be greater than three years only if I as an enterprise have an option to extend the legal right and it is reasonably certain that I will exercise the option to extend my legal rights. Clear? So I am saying the useful life can should be restricted to a maximum of the legal life of the asset. A useful life can exceed the legal rights only if the option to extend is available to the enterprise and it is reasonably certain that the enterprise will exercise its option to extend the legal rights. Sometimes there could come across a situation where there is an indefinite life. There is no definite life. Let's say Facebook has acquired WhatsApp. The purchase consideration minus the assets acquired, there is a significant amount of goodwill which emerged. Whenever there is a significant amount of goodwill which emerged, the goodwill is created due to the users on WhatsApp. Today also, WhatsApp is probably the only social network which has the highest number of users. The goodwill, what is the useful life? 10 years, 15 years, 50 years, 100 years, I don't know. There can always be a competitor who can come up tomorrow and all the users might shift into that network like Signal. Signal has come in and so many people have actually started using Signal. Now, unfortunately, we are using both Signal and WhatsApp. That is another issue. But sometime, let's say, maybe we tend to close down our WhatsApp and start our presence on Signal mode. So in such cases, the useful life or the life of the asset for which I expect economic benefits may not be ascertained with certainty. That is called as indefinite life. Indefinite means not infinite. Infinite means for any number of years, I will get the benefit. Indefinite means I don't know for how long, but I am getting the benefit, but I don't know for how long I'll be able to derive the benefit. It is called as indefinite life. Whenever an intangible asset is said to have an indefinite life, you cannot, you cannot calculate amortization. How do you calculate amortization? You tell me cost minus estimated residual value, which is generally considered as zero divided by estimated useful life. Let's say your estimated useful life is indefinite. You only don't know. Then divided by I don't know, what will be the answer? I don't know. That is the reason why I'm saying amortization for an asset which has an indefinite useful life cannot be ascertained. That means such kind of assets should not be amortized. Then what should I do? Such assets have to be tested for impairment every year. Every year I will test them for impairment instead of charging amortization on such kind of assets. Clear? So what am I saying? I am saying that sometimes there can we can come across an intangible asset where the useful life cannot be defined. I don't know how long that I will be able to use that particular asset. In such cases, I will call that as an intangible asset with indefinite life. Whenever an intangible asset is said to have an indefinite life, then I will not calculate amortization on that asset every year. Instead, I will charge or I will I identify impairment on that particular asset at the end of each year. Guys, if you look at India 36 regarding impairment, I will test an asset for impairment only if there is an indicator of impairment. If there is no indicator of impairment, I won't test it for impairment. Only. However, there are three assets which have to be impaired every year, whether there is an indicator or not. Whether you have an indicator, you don't have an indicator, I am least bothered. I will compulsorily test them for impairment. Out of those three assets, one of the assets is such intangible asset, which is uh, expected to have an indefinite useful life. What are the other two assets? I will discuss about that. But in detail, we'll take up when we are talking about India's 36. Three assets have to be impaired every year. Intangible asset with indefinite life. 
Number two, an intangible asset which is in the process of development. It is not completed. It is still in the process of development. That is number two. Number three, goodwill arising on business combination has to be tested for impairment every year. These are three assets where I don't charge am amortization. Instead of charging amortization, I will test them for impairment every year, whether there is an indicator of impairment or not. Clear? Now we have seen three determinants of depreciation, right? What are the three determinants of depreciation that we have covered? First one was cost, estimated useful life, estimated residual value. Now, these three are subjected to change. Why does the cost of an asset change? Can change. Impairment can change the cost of an asset. Revaluation also can change the value of an asset. Estimated useful life can change. My intention, my estimate can change. When I go to the exam hall and when I basically start thinking of prepare, preparing for the exam, my estimation that this subject I will get 70. Wrote the exam, I came out of the exam, I said 50. Result came 45. So there is a change in the estimate. So residual values and useful lives are pure estimates which are subjected to change. Whenever there is a change in determinant of depreciation, then it should always be given a prospective effect. What do you mean by prospective effect? That means the depreciation of the future periods should undergo a change. I will only change the depreciation of future periods. Clear? So that means the remaining cost of the asset should be depreciated over the remaining useful life of the asset. It should only be considered as a change in accounting estimate. Change in method of depreciation. Earlier I followed straight line method. Now I think sum of digits or written down value or reducing balance method is a much more up appropriate method here. Then in such cases also it is only a change in estimate. What, is, what estimate change? Depreciation or amortization should represent the pattern in which economic benefits are expected to be derived by the enterprise expected if you have change in expectation of deriving benefit from a particular asset then automatically the depreciation also will change if there is a change in the method of depreciation it is still a change in estimate my estimate of deriving economic benefit from the use of the asset has changed which required me to change the method of depreciation Therefore, it is a change in accounting estimate only to be given a prospective effect. Clear? With that, we come to the end of discussion on this concept of impairment, sorry, uh, depreciation and amortization, guys. We are done with this topic of India's 36, sorry, India's 38, 40 and 16, property, plant and equipment, intangible asset and investment property. Clear?
Yes, guys, let's get into this concept of impairment of assets now. We have seen property plan and equipment. We have seen intangible asset. We have seen your uh, pro investment property as well, where we have discussed about depreciation and amortization. When we are already depreciating the asset, amortizing the asset, what is this impairment now? Impairment also discusses about loss in value of asset. Even depreciation is also loss in value of an asset only. The depreciation arises due to three reasons. Depreciation of an asset arises due to three reasons. First one, wear and tear on use, obsolescence of technology, or lapse of time, passage of time. So wear and tear on use, lapse of time, obsolescence of technology are particular reasons for which depreciation is charged on a particular asset. If there is a fall in the value of an asset or a loss in the value of an asset arising for reasons other than depreciation, then I have to charge impairment on the asset. Let me put it like this. Let's say for example, I am transporting a particular, uh, I have asked you to transport a particular bench from the ground floor to the fifth floor. While you are taking it back to the fifth floor, the bench was dropped twice. On the stairs, you dropped the bench twice. Dumb. However, you have bought it to the fifth floor, you put it on the fifth floor. I saw the bench in the fifth floor, slight dents here and there. However, students can sit on the bench and still can use that bench. Straight question. Did the value of the asset reduce or no? Simple word. Did the value of the asset reduce? Yes or no? My phone dropped from here down. There is a compulsory physical damage suffered by the phone, but it was still in a working condition. Still working condition, you tell me, is there a decrease or reduction in the value of an asset? Yes, it is. The loss or fall in the value of an asset is due to wear and tear on use. No. Is it because of lapse of time? No. Did the technology change? No. That means there is a loss in the value of an asset, which is not because of reasons arising from depreciation. Such kind of reasons. If there is a loss in the value of an asset, it leads to impairment. Remember, reasons of impairment loss are generally isolated. They are quite abnormal in nature. They are not expected to recur. They are generally not expected to recur. I don't expect the loss or arising due to impairment to occur again and again. Clear? Yes, guys. So that is impairment. Impairment is a fall in value of an asset or a loss in value of an asset arising due to reasons other than depreciation. So reasons of depreciation are wear and tear on use, obsolescence of technology and lapse of time. Impairment occurs due to reasons which are other than these three. And these reasons are generally isolated and abnormal in nature. Clear? Let's move and look into impairment. How do I measure impairment? Impairment is measured by a simple formula carrying value of an asset minus recoverable amount. What do you mean by carrying value? It is nothing but book value of the asset. What is recoverable amount? I'll tell you. Recoverable amount is the amount which I expect to recover from the asset. I expect to recover such value from the asset. How can I recover value from my asset? Two ways. One, I can use the asset for its useful life or I can dispose the asset. Either way it is possible. Either I use the asset over its useful life or I dispose the asset. I can recover value from that particular asset. Which one will I do? Will I use the asset over the useful life or will I dispose? Depends. If by disposal I will get 100 rupees, 
If you use the asset, you will get only 50 rupees. I will dispose the asset. If by using the asset, the value in use is much greater than the value which I derive from selling the asset, then I'll obviously use the asset. Therefore, whichever is higher should be considered as recoverable amount. The amount which I expect to recover either from using the asset or by selling the asset, whichever is higher is called as recoverable amount. It is simply given as higher of value in use or net selling price. Net selling price is nothing but fair value minus cost to sell the asset. Fair value minus cost to sell the asset. Let's see a little bit of discussion on recoverable amount. What he says regarding recoverable amount is, he says, if an enterprise has no reason to believe that economic benefits derived from the sale of asset is greater than the benefits derived from the use of this. If I have no reason to believe that, I will get a greater benefit from selling, from selling the asset rather than from using the asset. Then I will say recoverable value is equal to value in use. I'll completely forget about that concept of net selling price. Yeah. First one. Why does this occur? You tell me first situation. Why does this occur first of all? What is a situation where I don't believe that selling the asset will give me greater benefit from using this? Let's say I purchased the asset just now. I am just started using the asset. Let's say you bought a bike. If I tell you, why did you buy a bike? You can happily go in a metro. You can sell the bike immediately. You can get so much of benefit. In such cases, I will not be inclined towards selling the bike. Because my intention is to basically use that bike. In such cases, I will never believe that selling the asset will give me a greater than benefit than using that asset. In such cases, recoverable amount is straightforward value in use. Never even calculate net selling price. Second one. If the fair value of an asset cannot be reasonable, reliably measured, you cannot reasonably ascertain the fair value of the asset. In such cases, if you cannot measure fair value, you cannot identify net selling price. When you cannot identify net selling price, the only way recoverable value can be calculated is by value in use. So therefore, I'm saying if the fair value of an asset cannot be reasonably estimated, cannot be measured with reasonable certainty, in such case, recoverable amount should be considered as value in use. You cannot calculate your net selling price. Do not say it is zero. I never said net selling price is zero. I just said you cannot measure with reasonable certainty. That's it. If the entity intends to recover the carrying value of the asset from sale rather than from use. That means this asset, I've already used it enough. My intention is now to dispose the asset and get some economic benefit. I have no intention to use the asset. In such case, recoverable amount will be considered as value will be considered as net selling price guys. Can you change the last third one? After you get your material, please change the last one. It is net selling price. That is fair value minus cost to sell. If an entity is intending to recover the carrying value of an asset from sale of the asset rather than from use of the asset, in such case, recoverable value is equal to net selling price. Clear? How do I calculate this fair value minus cost to sell? Which is nothing but net selling price. My net selling price to calculate, I should take out, I should identify what is the fair value of the asset and I should also identify what is the cost to sell. How do I measure fair value? I will measure fair value of the asset by applying the paragraphs of the standard in DS 113, where there are three approaches to calculate fair value. Market approach, income approach, cost approach. These are the three approaches which are stipulated under India's 113 for measurement of fair value. Then what about your cost to sell? How do I identify cost to sell? What are the inclusions in cost to sell? Cost incurred to make the asset marketable. 
I have an AC which is already fit into my house for five years. Now I find that it is not cooling sufficiently enough. I intend to sell the asset. I intend to sell and I'm looking at it. That is not possible. What should you do? Dismantle the asset. Take a few photographs. Put it up on OLX. So dismantling cost. Cost to basically put it up on OLX. All these costs should be included as cost to sell. Transaction cost. OLX reduced 1% of the sale proceeds for transaction done through OLX. That is called as cost of the transaction. Free fee for transfer of ownership. Let's say I am supposed to pay 500 rupees for transfer of ownership of a particular asset. Then that 500 rupees is considered to be a cost to sell that asset. In this way, I will have to estimate what is the cost of sale. Cost to sell the asset will have three inclusions. Transaction cost, cost incurred to bring the asset to a marketable state, fee for transfer of ownership of the property. Clear? These are the three costs to be included in cost to sell the asset. How do I determine fair value? My determination of fair value First indicator for determination of fair value is a binding sale agreement. If for an intangible asset or for a tangible asset, I have a binding sale agreement to dispose the asset at this particular date at a particular price. If I sell the asset at the end of year one, I will sell it to you at 150. If I sell the asset at the end of year two, I will sell it to you at 125. If I sell it at the end of year three, I will sell it at 105. If I sell it at the end of year 4, I will give it to you at 70. If I sell it at the end of 5th year, I will give it to you at 50. Binding sale agreement exists. In such case, your net selling price should be computed directly based on the agreement price. Whatever price at which you agreed to sell the asset, that should be the price at which I have to estimate your net selling price. Is it possible? Always to have a binding sale agreement may not be. Let's say I don't have a binding sale agreement at all. If I don't have a binding sale agreement, then I will see if there is an active market which exists for that particular asset. If active market exists, then the fair value is equal to the bid price in the active market. I'm saying if an active market exists, then the fair value is equal to bid price in the active market. Whatever is the bid price? What is bid price? Price which I expect from sale of the asset. What is ask price? The price at which I expect to purchase the asset. So which is more relevant here? Because I am intending for identifying net selling price. Therefore, which is more in, uh, appropriate? Bid price is more appropriate. An active market, however, does not exist. Bid price is not there. Man. First of all, if there is no bid price, then I will take the most recent transaction price and perform certain adjustments. If active market does not exist only for that asset, then I should be identifying the fair value based on market observable inputs. What are market observable inputs? Whatever information is available from the free market. Stock prices of shares freely available in the market. Vehicle uh, value of a new, brand new vehicle available in the market. However, if I cannot ascertain even by this method to establish a fair value, then I will not identify fair value at all. I will go back to num point number two and I will say, look at point number two, what did he say here? Where the fair value cannot be identified with reasonable certainty, then your recoverable value is equal to value in use. Don't calculate net selling price again. That is exactly what we'll do. Recoverable amount is equal to value in use. So what are the checks that he is doing? Binding sale agreement exists. Then the agreed price should be considered as fair value. If I don't have binding sale agreement, but there's an active market which exists, then the bid price in the market should be considered as fair value. If bid price is not available, take the most recent transaction price perform for some adjustments. If active market also does not exist, then use market observable inputs to determine fair value. 
sir even with the market available observable inputs i cannot determine fair value in such cases don't determine fair value at all forget about this concept of net selling price your recoverable amount is equal to value in use clear so i put in three conditions for this for recoverable amount i'm saying i have no reason to believe that the economic benefits from sale of a set will be greater than the benefits derived from use of the asset. In such case, a recoverable amount is equal to value in use. If the fair value cannot be reliably established or reasonably measured, then I need not calculate net selling price. Recoverable amount is equal to value in use. The enterprise intends to sell the asset. This asset is held for disposal only. I have no intention to use that asset. My intention is to recover the carrying value of the asset by sale of the asset rather from using the asset. In such case, recoverable amount is equal to net selling price that is fair value minus cost to sell. Here, this had to be changed. Point number three. And this is determination of fair value. Binding sale agreement exists, agreed price. Active market exists, bid price. Bid price not available, most recent transaction price perform such adjustments active market also does not exist fair value ascertained by market observable inputs you cannot ascertain fair value even like that don't ascertain fair value at all recoverable amount is equal to value in use clear
Yes, guys. So let's continue to the next topic of value in use. What is this value in use and how do I identify a value in use? Okay, it's very important to discuss about value in use, guys, because value in use is something very critical to analyze to identify your impairment, right? You cannot get impairment unless and until you identify the recoverable amount. Your recoverable amount is higher of value in use or net selling price. Until now, we were only talking about measurement of net selling price. That is fair value minus cost to sell. Now let's get into this concept of value in use because it's a very subjective concept. When I say subjective concept, I'll tell you why. Guys, if you remember the definition, uh, the recognition criteria under India 16 or 38 or 40, we said future economic benefits are probable to arise. Why did we use the word probable to arise? We use the word probable to arise because we said we do not know what is the quantity. We do not know uh, what is the uh, timing for at which we will get the benefit. So therefore, when you quant cannot quantify the benefit, you cannot determine the timing of the benefit. You simply say that economic benefits are probable to arise. I am probable to get the economic benefit. What is the exact amount of benefit? What is the exact timing of the benefit that I don't know? This is exactly what we are saying. So now let's look at how do I calculate this value in use? Value in use is equal to present value of future cash flows arising from the use of the asset. What is this present value of future cash flows? As we use the asset, there are certain set of cash flows which are generated from that asset. Such future cash flows generated from the asset should be discounted to their present value. Such present value of future cash flows arising generated from the use of the asset should be considered as value in use. What cash flows should I consider? I, my cash flows to be considered for computation of value in use are divided into three parts. First, cash inflows arising from continuing use of the asset minus cash outflows necessary to derive these cash inflows and net cash flows arising from the disposal of the asset at the end of its useful life. For example, I purchased a particular machinery where I input certain raw material of plastic. I get a plastic box out. Input of plastic is costing me about 100 rupees of kg. 100 rupees per kg. My output each box is 1 kg and can be sold in the market at 125 rupees. So what is the cash inflows generated from or arising from continuing use of the asset? Those boxes, plastic boxes, which can be sold at 125 rupees per kg is the cash inflow generated from the use of the asset. What is the cash outflow necessary to generate the inflow? The plastic input which is costing me 100 rupees per kg, which is a cash outflow to purchase the raw material to generate the cash inflows. I will use the asset over a period of five years. At the end of fifth year, I intend to sell the asset. When I intend to sell the asset, the asset will derive a certain cash flow, net cash flow arising from disposal of the asset. All these three combined, is considered as cash flows arising from the use or, or use of the asset over its estimated useful life and from the sale of the asset at the end of its estimated useful life. Clear? These cash flows should be discounted to present value to identify your value in use. When I say discounted to present value, then the question will be what should be the discount rate? 8%, 10%, 6%, 12%, 15%. What is the discount rate? He says it is a market assessment of time value of money plus risk associated with the asset. What is the market assessment of time value of money? Generally, market assessment of time value of money can be called as a, a corporate deposit rate or a corporate lending rate in SBI or a government bond rate can be considered as market assessment of time value of money or in our SFM sense, in your financial management sense, it is called as RF plus risk-free rate plus risk associated with the asset. 
what is the risk associated with the asset that there is a continuing demand for the output of the asset itself is a risk so there should be an element of risk which should be added to the time value of money or market assessment of time value of money that is rf plus certain risk market risk which is associated with the asset that will give me what is a discount rate using that discount rate on these set of cash flows which are arising over the useful life of the asset will be discounted to identify something called as value in use clear question first number number one how will you estimate cash inflows right how will you estimate cash inflows we only say future economic benefits are probable to arise that means you don't know when you will get the benefit you don't know how much benefit you will get that's why you said probable then how do i calculate value in use for this you will have to rely on projections management estimates which will give you a basis of identifying the cash flows expected to arise from the use of this current year the company sells 12000 units per month next year the management projects to sell 13500 units per month that next year they expect to sell 14000 units a month and finally in the third year they expect to sell 15000 units a month these are management projections these are management estimates these management projections and management estimates should form the basis for identifying your value in use clear cash flows should be determined by management estimates and projections and these estimates and projections can be made only for a maximum period of 5 years what is this 5 years logic he is saying that you cannot estimate you cannot estimate for more than 5 years a reasonable estimate can only be made over a period of 5 years if i ask you when you were studying your plus 1 and plus 2 if i ask you what would be your score in ca final what will your be your answer keep your mouth shut because i did not pass first of all plus 1 plus 2 forget about foundation whether i'll pass or not itself i don't know then you have ca inter which i'll pass or not i don't know final you are asking me directly what will be your score in ca final that is not even reasonable also if you would have at least asked me how much do you expect to get in ca foundation i'll be able to tell you so beyond that it is unreasonable to make an estimate same way accounting also has limitations according to your limitations he says you cannot estimate for a period beyond 5 years a reasonable estimate of management judgment of cash flows can be made for a period of 5 years only sir useful life of asset is 8 years sir useful life is 8 years you are saying you can make only cash flow estimate for 5 years what about the remaining 3 years for the remaining 3 years i will not take a management estimate what i will do is i will take the 5th year estimate and i'll add it with a growth rate what is this growth rate this growth rate to be considered beyond 5 years is always a steady growth rate or a declining growth rate. i can i expect to grow at the rate of 10% every year steady i expect to grow at 5% in year 6 4% in year uh, year 7 3% in year 8 and so on that is declining growth rate i expect to grow at the rate of 10% in year 6 11% in year 7 12% in year 8 is not possible because you cannot take an increasing growth rate in performing cash flow estimates in computation of value in use that's why he says if the useful life of an asset is beyond 5 years then the further cash flows beyond 5 years should be estimated using either a steady growth rate or a declining growth rate clear so what did i say value in use is nothing but value in use is nothing but present value of future cash flows arising from the continuing use of the asset and such cash flows which should be considered in computation of value in use are cash inflows generated from continuing use of the asset minus cash outflows generated from uh, uh, sorry 
cash outflows which are required to generate the necessary inflows third one net cash flows arising from the disposal of the asset at the end of its useful life and i said discount rate is rf that is time value of money market assessment plus any risk associated with that particular asset and I'm saying cash flows cannot be determined. The, your cash flow estimates should be based on management estimates and management judgments. However, those management estimates and judgments should not be made beyond five years. It is reasonable only for management estimates to be considered for a period of five years. Any period which is more than five years, if the estimated useful life of the asset is more than five years, I will not be basing on management judgments. From year six onwards, I'll identify the cash flows applying a steady or a declining growth rate. One really important concept which has been significantly tested in the exam multiple times is your foreign currency cash flows. What is this foreign currency cash flow? Foreign currency cash flow means if an asset generates cash flows in dollars or any other foreign currency then how do you estimate what should be the value in use of that particular asset? Okay, let me see. For example, let's say an asset is intended, X Limited is having an asset and this asset which owned by X Limited is basically selling only produce to outside India. Asset generates some output. That output generated by an asset is sold to customers in US Therefore, I will get back to the enterprise only amounts in dollars. In such case, when he asked me to identify value in use, I went on like this. Value in use. He wanted me to estimate the value in use. So I wrote it like this. Here, cash flows, discount factors, and discounted cash flow. Let's say this estim the estimated useful life of the asset is only three years. Easy purpose, I'm taking it. My cash flows given to me are all in million. Even my discounted cash flows are also in millions. Let's say first year 100 million, second year 125 million. Third year 140 million. So when your cash flows generated by the asset are in dollars each year, how do I calculate this part of value in use? Remember, guys, I need recoverable amount in rupee to compare it with the carrying value of the asset. I cannot calculate value in use in dollars. Then what do I do? It is not possible to identify the dollar value because I cannot multiply these directly with a exchange rate. Multiplying with exchange rate is not possible because I don't know what is the exchange rate after the first year, after second year, after third year. I have no idea. So instead what I will do is I will apply discount factors in dollars and I will also identify value in use in dollars. So if I get value in use in dollars, I will convert it into value in use in rupee. How will you convert value in use in dollars multiplied by spot rate that is today's exchange rate per dollar. This is only applicable when an asset is generating cash flows in foreign currency. If an asset is expected to generate cash flows in foreign currency, then apply only such foreign currency discount rate 
to calculate value in use. Such value in use in foreign currency can be converted into value in use in rupee by multiplying it with the spot rate. This is fundamentally what we understand for assets which are generating cash flows in foreign currency. First value in foreign currency is a sum of future cash flows into uh, sorry, foreign currency cash flows into foreign currency discount rate. Value in use in INR is equal to value in use in foreign currency multiplied by spot rate. Clear? Guys, there are multiple times questions which arise on this topic guys of value in use in foreign currency. Please be aware of that. Certain cash flows which should not be considered in computation of value in use. What are those cash flows? Cash flows pre, uh, uh, arising from financing activities like interest, tax. You cannot calculate tax. It should always be a pre-tax cash flow. Obligation already recognized as a liability. Like your dismantling cost already recognized as a liability. Future restructuring expense not committed for. After three years, I expect to incur another 20 million on this particular asset. And immediately after that, the efficiency of the, of the asset increases by 50%. That is a future restructuring cost. Have you committed for it? No, I am expecting to incur. They should not be considered. Incremental benefits arising from future restructuring of asset. If I incur the cost, in future the capacity utilization can go up by 50%. I cannot consider the extra benefit because I have not committed for that restructuring cost. When I haven't committed for the restructuring cost, benefits arising from such restructuring also cannot be considered in computation of value in use. Interest cash flow, tax cash flows, obligations already recognized as liability, future restructuring cost not committed for, benefits arising from future restructuring cost. These cash flows should not be considered in computation of value and use. Clear? How do I recognize impairment? You calculated value and use. You calculated net selling price. Higher of these two is recoverable amount. If your recoverable amount is less than carrying value of the asset, then the asset is said to be impaired. If your recoverable amount is less than the carrying value of the asset, then the asset is said to be impaired. If your recoverable amount is greater than carrying value of the asset, there is no impairment to be recognized. If there is impairment, that means the recoverable amount is, le recoverable amount is less than value in use. In such case, I will recognize the entry as impairment account debit to asset. I will write down the asset to the extent of the impairment identified. Such impairment, which is a loss in value of the asset, should be written off to PNL. However, if the asset was upward revalued earlier, that means earlier it was revalued upward, that means I have a revaluation surplus already existing. In such case, in such case, Instead of debiting PNL, I will debit revaluation surplus to the extent it is available. If an asset was upward revalued earlier, instead of debiting the impairment to PNL, I will debit it to the revaluation surplus available. Clear? That is recognition of impairment on individual asset. And we will go into the next about group of assets as well.
Yes, guys. So now let in, let's get into the concept of what is this group of assets. Guys, generally what happens is two or more assets put together will generate some sale. Let's say for example, I'll give you a best example. I have a simple manufacturing plant. This manufacturing plant, all it does is it takes paper. Okay. It goes into the first machine where wax is coated on the paper or wax is applied on that paper and then it is cut into size in the next machine and third machine is packing machine. It is packed and it is sold to the customer. That's it. Simple. Machine A deals with waxing. Machine B cutting. Machine C packing sale to customer. So that means three machines put together are generating some cash inflow. Correct? Three machines put together are generating cash inflows together. How much is the cash inflow attributable to machine A? How much is the cash inflow attributable to machine B? How much is the cash inflow attributable to machine C? Can you calculate like that? It is not possible. We cannot identify like that. You cannot identify how much of cash inflow can be attributed to each machine in such cases. When you cannot attribute how much should I give to each asset, how will you measure value in use? Tell me what is the value in use of machine A? I don't know. Because all three combined only cash inflow is generated. What is the cash flow uh, value in use of machine B or machine C? Same problem. You cannot calculate. When you cannot calculate, what is the value in use being generated out of each asset? While all the three assets put together are generating some sale, then we call such kind of assets as group of assets. We test for impairment not based on individual asset in such cases. We will test for uh, impairment based on group of assets and these group of assets are called as cash generating units. These group of assets are called as cash generating units. Clear? So whenever there is a cash generating unit, what should be uh, classified as a cash generating unit? If I do, if I just say cash generating unit is a group of assets which generate cash flows on a combination basis and cannot generate cash flows on an independent basis, then you will say entire enterprise as a whole is one group of asset only. To stop that, what the ICI has done is they have defined it CGU in a very particular manner. He says a CGU is a smallest group of identifiable asset. Smallest group. Very clear. Smallest group of identifiable assets which generate cash flows largely independent of other assets or other CGUs. They generate cash flows largely independent. I'm not saying completely independent. I'm just saying largely independent of other assets or, or other CGU. It is called as a cash generating unit or a group of assets for which an impairment should be tested on a combination. You cannot test them for impairment on individual asset basis. Clear? So if assets are generating cash flows on a combination of assets uh, reasonably allocated to the then cash generating if cash Flows arising from the above processes cannot be allocated to assets individually. All the assets within the process should be assessed for impairment together and such a group of asset is called as a CGU. Whenever I have a recognition of an impairment loss of a CGU, how do you recognize impairment loss of a CGU? Same thing. Carrying value minus recoverable amount. What is carrying value? Carrying value of all assets within a CGU. What is the uh, recoverable amount, net selling price of all the assets and the value in use of all the assets put together, whichever is higher is called as recoverable amount of the CG. This way, I'll identify an impairment. This impairment is not for individual asset. It is for all the asset within the CGU. Whenever you have this situation where there is an impairment to a CGU, I will have to allocate the impairment loss of the CGU to each asset in which on which basis I will allocate the impairment loss to each individual asset in the CGU 
in the proportion of their carrying value. A is to B is to C, I will allocate the impairment loss of the entire CG. Let's look at reversal. Someone was asking me this, I am talking about now. If in case, if in case there is a subsequent increase in recoverable amount, it is not impairment gain, it is reversal of impairment loss. That means for an asset which was already impaired earlier, if now you find that the recoverable amount has increased in such cases, I'll have to recognize a reversal of impairment loss. How do I recognize this reversal of impairment loss? Let's see. Let's say for example, there is an asset A. And this is year zero today. The carrying value of the asset was, let's say, about 100 rupees. On this 100, I charge impairment in year zero minus, I charged impairment in year zero and my impairment was 20 rupees which gave me a balance of 80 rupees after impairment loss right let's say the useful life of the asset was five years Then what should be the depreciation per annum? Depreciation per annum is 16. Correct? Sorry for that. Let's say the depreciation per annum is 16. Okay. Let's say subsequently in year 2, the recoverable amount has increased. And its increase was by 20. How much impairment did I recognize earlier? 20. How much did the recoverable amount increase now? 20. Can I reverse the impairment loss to the entire extent of 20? Answer is no. He, say, he gives you like this. He says, this happened in year 2 or let's say year 3. Your 100 rupee of an asset which when reduced by 20 rupees of impairment became 80. My depreciation in year 1 and year 2 have been 16 and 16 after impairment. Had that impairment not been charged, it would have been 20 and 20 each year. 5 years, right? So therefore, what is the written down value? WDV in year 3. Had this impairment loss not been recognized earlier, it would have been 60. Since impairment loss was recognized earlier, it is only 48. He is saying the reversal of impairment loss cannot be 20. Because if I reverse it by 20, 
then this will be added by 20 and the total will become 68 which is much more than the written down value had that impairment loss been not recognized earlier. So he says the reversal of impairment loss can be only a difference between these two that is to the extent of 12. So I am saying reversal of impairment can be maximum 12. 20 is not possible. So what are you saying? Reverse impairment loss in such a way that the carrying value of the asset after the reversal of impairment loss should not exceed the carrying value of the asset had impairment loss not been recognized earlier. You can reverse the impairment loss in this asset at the end of year 3. But even if you increase, you increase in such a way that it does not exceed 60. So therefore, reversal of impairment loss cannot be 20, but should be restricted only to 12. This is what he is explaining it to you in the form of a written form, where he says, reversal is lower of the recoverable amount minus carrying value, which is 20, or Carrying value of the asset if impairment loss was not recognized earlier, 60, minus carrying value of the asset now, that is 48. So, reversal of impairment loss is assessed only if the asset is impaired earlier and the reversal of impairment should be maximum up to the carrying value of the asset had the impairment loss not been recognized earlier. This is a fantastic concept re regarding reversal of impairment. Let's get into the last concept regarding this. This is impairment of goodwill. We have one more miscellaneous topic as well. Yes, guys. Goodwill is also an asset. Goodwill should also be impaired. Think about it. Impairment of goodwill is equal to carrying value of goodwill. You know, book value you can identify from the balance sheet minus recoverable amount of goodwill. What is recoverable amount of goodwill? Value in use of goodwill or net selling price of goodwill, whichever is higher. Can you sell goodwill alone? May not be possible. Can I identify value in use only of the goodwill? Goodwill generates cash flows. No, no. Goodwill is arising because all other assets put together generate cash flows much more than anyone else. That is my goodwill. Clear? Therefore, you cannot measure recoverable amount of goodwill. Since you cannot measure recoverable amount of goodwill, you cannot impair goodwill individually. So what they do, you can transfer goodwill or allocate goodwill to each individual asset or to group of assets on a non-arbitrary basis. What is non-arbitrary? Doesn't That means total 1 lakh assets. Total goodwill 10 lakhs. 10 lakhs divided by 1 lakh 10 rupees to each asset. No, that is arbitrary. What is non arbitrary? You need to identify which particular asset is actually generating goodwill. If there are 10 or 15 assets in the organization, of which 6 assets are generating goodwill, then goodwill should only be allocated among those 6 assets. So, that is fundamentally what is very important. I am into sale of men garment as well as women garment here. Designated machines are there into men garment, designated machine into women garment. Men garment, there is no significant sale. Women garment every time sale, winter sale, summer sale, autumn sale, spring sale, everything sale. Men garment, same t-shirt, same pant, irrespective of climate. So sales were not great. Woman garment sales were great. That means my goodwill of the enterprise is being significantly generated due to the woman garment and not due to the men garment. Therefore, my goodwill should be allocated only to the assets employed under woman garment, under manufacture of woman garment. Out of the woman garment also, my western garments are being sold amazingly well. 
So that means my goodwill should be allocated only towards such assets which are which are uh, uh, you know generating women garments especially in the western wear segment that is called as non arbitrary allocation of goodwill to assets clear therefore goodwill cannot be impaired individually but goodwill should be allocated to assets or cgus or group of cgus on a non arbitrary basis if an asset or a cgu to which goodwill is allocated got impaired if an asset or a cgu to which goodwill got allocated is impaired then the impairment should be adjusted first against the value of goodwill and subsequent to the value of the asset so how much ever impairment is there first to you knock off the goodwill if more impairment is there then only you reduce it from the value of the asset clear reversal of impairment loss on goodwill is not possible it is completely restricted as per india's 36 you are not supposed to reverse impairment loss on goodwill clear yes guys now i'll come to the last topic of the standard can the impairment loss exceed the carrying value of the asset you tell me can impairment loss be greater than carrying value of this possible impairment is equal to carrying value minus recoverable amount. correct so that means it is not possible for me to see that the carrying value the impairment is greater than the carrying value of this however i will give you one situation what if recoverable amount itself is negative what if recoverable amount itself is a negative amount then what will happen if recoverable amount is negative then minus of minus plus so recoverable amount is equal to carrying value plus uh, impairment is equal to carrying value plus recoverable amount now question comes up sir why will that recoverable amount be negative why will it be negative higher of value in use or net selling price higher of these two should be zero or more than zero why is it negative abnormal situation this can arise ica loves abnormal man. that's why this question has appeared so many times in the exam such an abnormal situation guys i'll tell you what abnormality it has logic simple let's say i think very recent story i'm talking about 2019 Mark the end of 2020 actually mark the end of bs4 four-wheeler vehicles no more bs4 cars will be sold after first April, up to or after first april 2020 that is the concept so what happened i have a machine which makes engine components it fits only engine components which are of bs4 variant and not of bs6 variant then what will happen automatically i cannot use the asset anymore the government has particularly issued a notification saying that all those machines which are into into making or manufacturing bs4 components should be shut down they have to be dismantled he clearly said this then what will happen value in use no value in use net selling price yes value in use i don't have but i have net selling price what is the net selling price fair value from sale of a set zero minus cost to sell no cost to sell but there's a cost to dismantle the asset so what will happen that means sometimes it happens to be a situation where a particular asset no longer can be used no longer can be sold but the enterprise has an obligation to dismantle the asset the enterprise obligation to dismantle the asset is a negative recoverable amount therefore the impairment can exceed exceed the carrying value of the asset recognize entry impairment loss to asset not possible because your impairment is more than carrying value that's why he writes 
impairment account debit, two carrying value of the asset, two liability for dismantling the asset. So whenever we come across this kind of abnormality where the asset cannot be used, cannot be sold, but the enterprise has an obligation to dismantle the asset or basically crack down the asset. In such cases, we come across this phenomena. Clear? Read that paragraph. When an asset has a restriction on further use or sale and the enterprise has an obligation to dismantle and remove the asset by incurring certain cost, then the carrying value of the asset plus cost of dismantling is equal to impairment. In such case, the asset should be derecognized and in addition, a provision is required to be created for the estimated future dismantling cost. Clear? And that will bring us to the end of this topic or discussion under India's 36. There is one more small part regarding corporate assets. Kindly make sure that you go through that concept. But corporate asset concept is very similar to goodwill concept. Clear?